Another road, another journey. Have I ever travelled this way before? Will I ever travel this way again? And where does this road take me? To new horizons? New worlds? To hidden parts of myself? Will I ever get to the source of my pain? Will I ever release my pain? Dry my tears, let go of my weariness, and feel joy in my life. Will I ever beat in tune with my heart and be at peace with who I am? And now I am here, on this blue couch, laid down next to an expert, a facilitator, a therapist, closing my eyes and looking into my own private worlds, the darkness behind my eyelids, illuminated through looking within me, nervous yet trusting the person next to me, willing to face the unknown inside of me, hoping that she leads me through the causes of my problems. Quest led me here to this therapy room, eager to learn something about a chance to heal, to evolve. Having heard about this particular therapeutic approach, regression therapy, feeling drawn to what I have been hearing, it somehow resonates within me, making me want to understand more about it. Could this be a way for me? Another step on my own personal journey. So what better way to find out than to ask those who have practiced and taught this approach over many years and hearing from people who have already been clients. The journey took me to Clev in Germany where a meeting of therapists from all around the world took place. Here I hope to find out more information answers for all of my questions. And so I just waltzed right into the middle of their gathering the convention of an association of regression therapists named Earth. <laughs> Here is what I learned. Earth is an association of practicing regression therapists which stretches beyond the boundaries of Europe where it all began. Regression therapy is a modern form of psychotherapy where the client with the assistance of the therapist looks for experiences in their past where their problem has been caused in discovering, reliving and understanding those causes they are able to find deep and lasting relief. The term past can mean two weeks ago, 20 years ago, the time we were in the womb, or even 200 years ago within a former life. 
a substantial number of regression therapists in Europe and also from all around the world have joined together to form the Earth Association. To facilitate both contact and further training for members, there is the annual Earth Convention. This is an opportunity to physically meet and talk where the therapist can attend instructive and experiential workshops and formally exchange experiences or get to know each other in a relaxed surrounding. Obviously there is much to share and to learn from each other. In this colourful and lively environment of very different characters, I had the chance to meet some selected members of Earth, experienced regression therapists and trainers internationally famous within this field. They will hear and answer my questions connected with the subject regression therapy. Marion Boone is a regression therapist since 2000 and an international trained for Earth, an active organizer of international events related to the field of regression therapy. The trance is already there, so in fact regression therapy is to get them out of trance. They're in the trance of the problem, so that's what we do. Trisha Kitano is internationally known as a pioneer in inner child integration and regression therapies. She has trained psychotherapists and healthcare professionals in many countries. So you start with this person who's like this, and then you, you watch the flower unfold, petal by petal they open up and become who they are. And so for me, that's the joy. So I ran back over because I wanted to There is Dr. Morris Netherton, a renowned Los Angeles therapist and founder of the Institute for Past Life Awareness. Since 1960, he has been a true pioneer within the field of regression therapy. He has over 30 years of clinical practice in alternative treatment modalities. His book, Past Lives Therapy, was the first in the field of regression therapy. I, just, I tell people, past life therapy allows you to stop doing things to people and start doing things with people because you want to. Roger Walger is a psychotherapist, international trainer and author, specialized in past life regression, spirit release and shamanic healing. With degrees in psychology, religion and philosophy and his training as an analyst at the Carl Jung Institute in Zurich, Roger Walger developed his own method called Deep Memory Process. Uh, what we now call regression therapy or regression to past lives is tuning into one layer of this many layered thing called, I call it universal memory, the great memory, the Akasha. Hans Ten Dam is an international trainer, regression therapist since the early 80s. He's the author of Exploring Reincarnation and Deep Healing. Hans is the current president of Earth. The most beautiful sessions are when the deepest pain is healed. And healing of the deepest pain always leads to an experience that you can only describe as being mystical.
So I will trust my therapist and my intuition that I am in the right place at the right time. And here I go. Not to take it easy, but to reach out for solutions and for healing within my deeper self. Closing my eyes and going deep down. Even so, what exactly is regression therapy? To relive cathartically the origin of your problems. And cathartically means that you will understand them, you will feel really relieved, you will feel your vitality restored, it's really resolved. Regression therapy deals with the cause of the trauma and the problem and most other therapies and medical methods deal with the results or the effects of trauma. So going back to where the trauma occurred, going through the trauma again to break up the energy and the emotions that have been impacted or blocked uh, and by releasing those emotions and feelings a person can stop the reactive patterns of responding to the old information because that then becomes complete and then they can make conscious choice in now time of what they want to do with their life instead of reacting to the programs of the old traumas. Um, I understand the kind of work where you take a person, a client, into an inner process uh, contacting what, in my language, will be the deeper unconscious mind. The therapist uh, guided me to the core of my current problem. Uh, and that was his intention, as we had discussed it before. Uh, and from the uh, process, it seemed that I went to the uh, root of my current situation. It was as if I'm, I was watching a movie, that I was participating in that. It was my movie, my story. It was me watching in... Um, full mind, body, spirit and the feelings, they were, they were all mine. I have been a therapist and a patient for a long time. So as a patient I have seek Seeked, is that a good one? Seeked uh, therapy to get out of the uh, yeah the load of the Japanese camps that my parents and my brothers brought in our family. Even with psychoanalysis, I could not find it. Although I myself am trained as a psychoanalyst, so I went quite deep for what they called was therapy to go to the deepest and I couldn't find the catharsis that I needed and the insights that I needed to to get it off my back and not live it as in our family um, the victims of the Japanese camps were the perpetrators of the children after the war and I was the first one seriously with whatever the client comes. So they start to access what's in there. And they learn to listen. Like we are listening to the client, the client is yes. listening to his inner material, to his inner voices, if you would like to say it like that. I do an interview uh, that over about two hours, the first time I see someone, that gradually begins to bring those memories from the past into their life here and now. 
I have never hypnotized anybody. I have never tricked anybody. I simply question them as to the trauma and the changes that they need in their life. And by the time I have done that, they're that close to being in it. Usually all I have to say is, you know where you are now. You're exactly where you need to be. All you need to do is go on in and take me with you. What's the first thing that comes to mind? And believe me or not, if or not it, it works. I asked for a demo session, and in that demo session, in the workshop, I just really hit, could help me to get on the terror that my mother must have felt during the Japanese camps. And she had that in her body, so when she conceived of me, it was just given to me. It was passed on to me. And I had carried that all along, and also the, the attitude of not feeling, because all those war uh, victims, they don't dare to go in feelings. I, she said, if you feel anxiety, you're dead. So you don't feel. And that was how we were brought up, not feeling. And that was so clear in that session, that in that demo session with Netherton, that I thought, no, no, this is, this is enough. This is enough. I live her life. I'm not living mine. This is enough. This is going to change. And I thought, okay, I'm very bad. I can hardly walk. And I don't want to go with crutches. And I don't want to go in a wheelchair. I want to go on my own legs. And willpower is something that you need to survive camps. I needed that to survive my sickness. It was help. I had three weeks uh, every day a session of two or more hours. And he made an intake and he started with birth. He asked me for every surgery or um, probably a moment of unconsciousness I had had in my life. Um, he asked me for uh, the whole family constellation, of course, and the uh, atmosphere. Um, during that intake, there were about three sentences that I said that in a certain per period I looked like a lepra, a, le a lepra patient. He wrote that down. He said, that's one past life. Okay. Um, in another situation, the divorce of my husband, the father of my daughter, I said, it felt like I would drown. He said, that's the second one, past life. And in another one, there was a real betrayal. And I uh, really felt like murdering. Really so angry, I could murder him. That's the third one. So, besides going through birth, pre-birth, uh, the, the death, child that was born before me, how probably I would be, it came out clearly, I was suspecting that, and it came out very clear, the birth, not bonding with my mother, the feelings of uh, always feeling like I should have been a boy, and I don't know where it comes from. Going through that, it was so obvious that my father wanted a son, that even after that, it is no, never occurred to me again that I would have to be a man, or, or, or I should have been born like a boy, or something. It was quiet, it was his thing. So during the process of Netherton's uh, way of working, all those uh, passed on uh, uh, convictions, just were so clear and so separated from that's from my father, that's from my mother, that's from the surgeon, that's from whoever intruded my uh, my energy when I was unconscious or uh, physical hurt, physically hurt or whatever, whatever. And it it was like one big train every day that was going on. And 
even past lives, just, yeah. I could hear everything that was happening outside, yes. It felt very well, actually, to play on your own movie and observe it at uh, the same time. I wasn't in any way hypnotized or I was there in the present. So, no, there was no worry of coming out. I was out and in at the same time. So I found myself living in a, a very small house, most probably an orphan without the knowledge of it though, uh, raised by an old man, a strange figure, very severe, um, that apparently he was suffering himself as I saw it, and he had to raise this child with his way so this child could not face this man because he was sick he was old he was always very angry and the child was afraid so during the uh, recreation that we did uh, i saw myself the way i reacted how scared i was with the tone of his voice even and what was happening at that time and my story then, um, it was how I balanced to escape or resolve that situation. So with, with whatever chance I had as a little child, I was sneaking out of the window. Uh, the, the little house was by a beach, so I was going down to the beach trying to find people and friends and, and play with. But I saw myself really, really scared and terrified with their behavior. And the thing is that what we do is we go wherever the person needs to go to access the trauma and resolve, the, that will resolve the issue. And there are specific methods of how to get to that particular place in time. If you, if you just sit and listen and keep your mouth shut, which is hard for some people to do, but You'll, they will tell you. I, I will start a session by saying, look, as we've been talking, you have put yourself where you need to be. You already talked yourself into the, uh, the place where we need to start to make you happy and healthy here. Now, go on into it and take me with you. And, and you, people are always astounded when they do it. But you ask with, with integrity and you ask with honesty, too. Basic methods that I label are regression, which means most simply, okay, go back to the very first time you had this feeling, etc. Unhappiness or fear, whatever, and then finding out what story develops. And very often that story ends with a death, and very often it's a dramatic death or a confused death, but not necessarily. The second method is a cluster of methods that I call personification, and includes things that are common in Gestalt or voice dialogue, etc. So the basic instruction there is just imagine that you're in your own home or in your study or in your bedroom. The door opens and the main reason of your problem now enters the room. And usually it's kind of person. It may be your dead grandmother, it may be your father, it may be a figure that you can't understand, it may be the devil, it may be a dark cloud, whatever it is. And you're going to explore that and dialogue with that. And the third is what we usually call energy work. It basically means that you have the people imagine that, for example, their problem is the kind of presence, a kind of energy or substance that's inside their body. 
So you feel guilty. Okay. Just try to feel where can you find that guilt most strongly in your body. And it will, for example, say on your chest. There is a weight on it. Just imagine that there is a real weight on it. What kind? It may be a rock, it may be a person. How, how heavy is it, etc. And so we are going to take away the rock. So in energy work, you take the problem and you visualize the problem and you, you try to have them feel the problem as a substance or an energy that is close to them or inside them and then you're going to manipulate it. It's just a trick, an important trick to make the, to make the problem that is intangible, tangible. And what is especially, what is essential is the relationship to bodily experience, body feelings, like an aesthetic experience, warm, cold, but feelings in the body. The body is, especially in energy work, uh, that's where we do it. That's the territory where we work with. In every good session, elements of all three methods are there. So it's not either one method or the other, but I found that these three together are the most simple toolkit you need to resolve anything that is not purely medical. I heard you say, can I use my ability? Can I use mm -hmm. my power? Yeah. I also heard you say, I'm not valued for my work. Mm -hmm. Could you repeat a few times? I am not valued. I am not valued. I am not valued. And change the words into your own words. How you feel it right now. I name this method a direct focus method. It is, um, it is the approach of the verbal information, the feeling that goes with it, and the somatical uh, the body uh, feeling that the client has. So somebody may say, oh, my life is, is, is a misery. So how does it make you feel? How does it make me feel? Well, miserable. Well, where do you feel it in your body? Especially my stomach. My stomach is upset. And I have headaches. So then you have two somatic places and an information verbal on the life. And then you use verbal techniques to to focus directly to the issue. And then we have an emotion, a somatic, a mental thought, and we can start. That's enough to start a session. I'm not allowed to use my phone. That's the strongest. So keep on saying that, please. I'm not allowed to use my power. Mm -hmm. I'm not allowed to use my power. Mm -hmm. And what emotion does it give you? I start crying. Yes, let it come. I'm not allowed to use my power. Yeah. I'm not allowed to use my power. Yeah, and where do you feel this sadness most strongly? Let it come. Your body knows. Where do you feel it most strongly? in your belly. Please put your hand on your belly. So the belly is keeping the charges. I'm not allowed to use my power. Yeah. Feel it. She's already feeling it very intense. So I'm going to come from five to one. And at one you will get images of the very first situation that you had when you felt your belly rambling. And you have this thought, I don't feel I'm allowed my power. Allowed to use my power. Go back in time, five, four, three, to the place and the time where you are not allowed to use your power. Three, two, one, let the images come. You feel this sadness and your belly rambling. Where are you and what is happening? As a rule, there is a physical indicator, an emotional indicator, and a mental indicator. And in fact, you only need one, because when you have one and you exaggerate it, the others will show. 
So that's why I name it the direct focus. Yeah. And then, of course, you could start with energy work and visualizations, but that's more for groups. In a one-to-one -one session, you can just start. It's not like a real body or I can change bodies, but I'm on Earth. Mm -hmm. I'm sure about that. And I'm a very important person. Mm -hmm. Are you a I'm a man. I'm a man. Yeah. What age are you? old for that time, but maybe 40. Mm -hmm. I, I have the feeling I'm kind of traveling around mm -hmm. to, um, and, and people come to me to, yeah, um, they want to be healed or they have questions. Mm -hmm. And I have um, this um, place where nobody can find me. Yeah. Where is it? Yes. Um, it's in a mountain. It's a, a desert like area and um, Is that where you live? Yeah, I go there from time to time to reload my energy and I need that to be alone to when I was working in India, I was doing a certain method I call core issue. You go to the deepest pain you have, and you go as deep as you can, and you feel it as completely as can as you can, and you go as possible deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and it will be more horrible and more black and more lonely and more cold or whatever it is that experience is and in some moments there is a complete spontaneous inversion and people come into an absolute state of calm of serenity of happiness etc so these Indian people will say ah oh, they are going into Satori in half an hour if you go to a guru, it takes us years. So I said, yes, that's because what you are taught there is to go up. And I teach you to go down. So in the deepest shit, you can find a solution. How will I know that I don't just make it all up? A fantasy, a dream. Um, that's a very complex question, and uh, there's been a lot of controversy about whether therapists can induce memories in clients, whether you can plant a memory in a client uh, and the client will believe it's real. It's called the false memory syndrome. Um, it would take a whole other interview to go into that. But I believe if you um, get away, get a person into a fairly uh, rich state of trance, the memories that come up will be authentic. They won't be fantasy. Fantasy uh, belongs more to the conscious ego. But there's a kind of remembering that belongs to the deeper self or the soul, which you can't um, fabricate, you can't fake that. So it depends on the state of consciousness the person is in. Another thing is that many people carry memories in their bodies, and uh, when you focus on that area, for example, if you focus on a neck pain, you might suddenly get an image of a sword hacking at your your neck or you get a chest pain and you get a picture of a rock crushing you. Those images come so quickly and spontaneously uh, it's highly unlikely that the person made them up. And in fact three people with completely very similar neck pains will come up with three totally different images because the memories, the pains there are specific to specific past lives. And I personally believe, in my experience, is the body never lies. The body doesn't invent things. 
We don't make up pains in our bodies. They feel real. Um, sometimes in a past life, a person will be remembering a horrible situation. I have a good example. A woman remembered being a, a soldier in a prison who was chained to a wall and he was awaiting execution and he was going to be hanged the next day and uh, at, I said move forward in your memory see what happens next and she goes into a kind of a dreamy state in the regression she says oh I'm getting my hands out of these chains oh there's a little um, window in the cell and oh, it seems like an opening I can just squeeze through Oh, now I'm running through the mountains and I find this hut and there's this old man and he takes me in and heals my wounds. Well, I listen to the story and I think, this doesn't sound real to me. This sounds like a fantasy. So I went back again and I very carefully, and I psychodrama the, the chains and I said, show me how you get out of the chains again. And she goes back and she relives it. She said, I can't get out. I can't get out. I'm going to die and then we followed the story follow what happens to your body the next day they take this man and they take him and they hang him what had happened in the past life memory the chained up prisoner had become delirious and gone into a delirium and the delirium dream state he'd imagined he'd had a fantasy of escape so we could tell the difference when we brought the body into the story because the body didn't lie this was an out-of-body fantasy. People, when they're unconscious, when they're deeply traumatized, delirious, delirium is another state, they will leave the body and they will go on imaginary journeys, which are real as psychic events, as dream events, but they're not real as past lives. So there's very subtle distinctions within a past life itself. There's different states of consciousness, even in a past life memory. And the more we've looked carefully at this, the more we can make quite fine distinctions between what is memory, what is fantasy, what is imagination. I don't think fantasies heal. Well, of course, in a session, you cannot be like a kind of super detective or judge, judging all the time, is this real, etc. Because even if it's real, it may be polished. Uh, if I'm in the, uh, in the victim mode, I may embellish my sufferings and if I'm a very positive or I'm narcissistic I may embellish other parts of the story and they may be polished or more romantic and it still can be basically true and of course our our profession is it to make the stories as truthful as possible but when I hear a story that is more or less symbolic is fake or just is impossible I don't accept that. I go to the level of real experience whenever I can get there. And if I can't get there, I did something wrong or the, therap the, 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 the client was not ready for it, I don't know. I don't care at all for fantasies. Nice for kids, not for adults. We try to go to the real thing. And of course, very often you don't know, you cannot test it, you cannot, but anyway, the story should fit, the story should be reasonable, should be, should give a good explanation. Yeah, reality first and reality only. Yeah, it's, uh not something miraculous, it's uh, so beneath the surface that you can reach it very easily if you tune into that. So if a therapist like uh, we are trained and Nathan and Hansen now just hear you talk and know there is another load on it and they touch it, you go. If it's, it, if it's um, not taken serious and you haven't taken it yourself serious then you can walk over it very easily but it's not something of um, being in another world it's not at the same time I'm here in this room 
and at the same time I'm with you or with Netherton or with Hans and I go in a memory that is maybe not of this life and maybe in other clothes and maybe in other ethics but the body tells me whether it's true or not and when you feel the same rage or the same sadness or the same human feelings that you can feel in this life too you you know you're right you know, you're not and if I feel nothing and it's like a mental thing going on then I feel I'm not there then it's more a construct yeah. and there's a real difference you know I know stuff and it's not something difficult to do it seems that it's a very effective method for trauma resolution if we're talking about trauma uh, among other uh, uh, results that the therapy has and um, I, what I did because that's how I work I researched it before I went to see a therapist so if we have any doubts the information is there it's in the internet I would uh, recommend to the people to see uh, an accredited therapist that has gone through the proper training, and this is very important, and to approach the subject with a very open mind and see what happens. falling apart, being a taunt to be my partner, my body, my life. Life is just a, a vast maze. Don't understand myself. Others seem to be on a pointless stroll through the emptiness of their lives. Or struggling with unexplainable body pains or held back by strong ties and hang-ups that just don't seem to shift bound by fears or anxieties or feeling disconnected to others alone and ungrounded so many problems waiting to be solved So who is a suitable client for regression therapy? Am I one? Right here on this couch? Phobias, anxiety attacks, panic syndromes, um, Difficulties in relationships, uh, addictive problems, alcohol, drugs, um, the whole range of human problems that are generally presented to psychotherapy. People really want to heal. I think that's really important. Are they there because they want to heal or are they there because they've heard of this weird thing and they want some sort of a magical solution to their problems? Oh, the past life and then my husband will love me again. I mean, it just isn't the way life works. The main reason would be ongoing depression. Things that don't change. It goes on too long. Uh, chronicle diseases even. Um, problems in life that repeat themselves. The patterns in, in life. That's a good reason to do regression therapy. Uh, um, uh, when I started my studies with Hans ten Dam, he once said, when it's not logical, it is suitable for regression therapy. Because, because there is no medical cause, it's not logical, but you do it, and you don't like it, and it's devastating, you don't want to do it, and yet you do it. So that pattern. Things like what I'm doing here, or I feel alienated, or I don't feel at home, 
what's my purpose in life, that kind of stuff. Are there behaviors that um, are illogical and out of context and have no apparent origin in this lifetime? Um, are there medical things that are occurring that the doctors simply can't find any cause for? Um, are there, um, uh, I know a woman who used to have uh, terrible eczema all up her arms and down her back. Very painful, very itchy. She'd been to every doctor, tried every medication, herbs, acupuncture, and the whole nine yards. Nothing had worked. And she said, well, you're my last hope. <laughs> and so I said, well, you know, we'll do what we do, and what happens, happens. And so she regressed back into a lifetime as an American Indian. And um, uh, they had been um, uh, invaded by white people and... Um, and her baby was dying, she was holding her baby, and, uh, and she had gotten smallpox, and, the, and she'd broken out all over her body with the smallpox, and her, and her feeling was, my baby's dying, I can't protect my baby, there's nothing I can do. And this enormous sense of hopelessness, and, and of losing everything she had, her clan, her, her husband, her, most of all, her child. So when she came into the present life, her husband started an affair with another woman, and that triggered this reactive response in her body of her body on fire and burning. And uh, so, we, after doing that past life, the hives disappeared and never came back. <laughs> Very effective. People go to this type of therapy because other types of therapy didn't work. They have been to doctors, they have been to psychologists, they have been to psychiatrists, and it don't work. That is a very common reason they come to us. And hearing from people who have already been clients. Um, I went through a trauma, uh, the result of which was a post-traumatic distress syndrome, which is something very hard to treat. So if there was a need, and I try this with the method. In our family, um, the victims of the Japanese camps were the perpetrators of the children after the war, and I was the first one. So I had been physically, sexually, mentally, emotionally abused. And uh, that, that was, I've done that since I was 20. I want to get my health and my mental health. I didn't know at that moment I had cancer, but I still wanted to get out of all those miserable feelings, the aggression that I felt, the sadness that I felt, the anxiety that I could feel. And my situation had so much worsened that it was cancer, and they told me I had to live maybe six months. And that was medio June 2001. And the internal uh, specialist said, you have to go to the oncologist. I said, no, I won't go there. And he said, why not? You need treatment. I said, chemotherapy and radiation and surgery is not treatment. It's just symptomatic and very destructive uh, treatment. I don't, uh, that's not treatment. So I said, I don't know what I will do, but I won't do it. And the only thing I knew was I want to live. I have no idea what for because I was very, very ill. About 40 kilos, uh, skin and bones, could hardly walk anymore. My muscles were, uh, were going less and less. They were almost not there anymore. And are there any people seeking help who should not attend a regression therapist? There's a certain kind of new age client that wants to 
glamorize their resume by getting rather special past lives. And they always want to be, go back as Egyptian priestesses or something glamorous. And I don't work with them. That's spiritual narcissism as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there are some people, um, there are borderline cases for whom to go directly into past lives would be contraindicated because uh, certain types of what we call schizophrenia, they've already got too much information that is flooding them from possibly past lives, possibly other levels of the psyche. And they need to create boundaries and create a sense of self. And if you start taking them to even more stories, they will get further overwhelmed. It'll, you'll be going the opposite direction. So I would rarely, special cases, I might work with a schizophrenic if I see something that could be specifically connected to a past life. But in general, I avoid working with them. The difficult clients are those who use tranquilizers, uh, medication that is um, influencing the consciousness because you go into symbolism. They cannot touch the depth of their body feeling. Let me put it very blunt. When your mind is a mess, don't go. It may become more messy. You need something else first. And the other type of client that I will not recommend, if your mind is a closed case, is fixed, is dogmatic, is a prison, don't go there. You need some open-mindedness and you need some common sense. If you deliberately determine that you will only believe the truth of objective science and you don't listen to your own body, then I wouldn't waste my time on that. I did before. But I wish them well, but not with me. to do a, a linear regression going back to the very first time it happened. 
And so I was using that method with a client. And so I said, okay, now go to an earlier experience when you feel this aloneness. Okay, now an earlier lifetime. We kept going earlier and earlier. We went pre-bodies. And then um, I said, okay, now move earlier and look down at your feet. Silence. I said, what's happening? I don't have feet. I said, oh, well, your feet are cut off. What do I know? So I said, okay, well, look down at your hands. She I said, okay, are you in a body? No. Are you between lines? No. Are you in another dimension? No. So I finally got smart and shut up and said, what's happening? She said, I don't know. I just know I am. One young man, um had a long growth tumor on his neck, and, and, this, and I learned a big lesson with him. I went in and sat down, I said, what you got on your neck? He said, I don't know, it's got a bump. I said, well, well, let's see. I said, what does that feel like? He said, I don't know. Well, sit back there. So he sat back, leaned against the wall, and I said, if something were going to happen to you, that would cause your neck to, to do that, would it cause a bump like that? What's the first thing that comes to mind? What would happen? They would hang me. Oh, okay, well, let's hang you. Okay. So, now, get this. He's not, he's not the least bit scared or apprehensive about what I'm doing. And I went, there you go. And he went, and, and he's up. And he said, oh, well, what's the next thing? The, the, Oh, and the next thing, and he went through about ten, half a minute to a minute, quick little, quick little things that would pull a, pull a bump on his. And I said, well, that was good work. Um, when are you having your surgery? He said, tomorrow. I said, well, good luck. I'll see you when I, when I get back. So I went on home, and I came back uh, two days later, and he's sitting there. I said, well, How's your surgery? He said, I didn't have it. I said, what do you mean you didn't have it? He said, well, I went up there, and that old doctor came over, and he started picking on my throat, and he said, he said well, can't, hmm, where did that, where did your tumor go? And the kid said, I don't know. You tell me. He said, well, I can't find it. He said, and he called another doctor in. Another doctor came in, and, he could, and so they took an x-ray, and it wasn't there. And finally, the, the doctor said, well, we'll just do surgery anyway. And this kid said a very distinctive word like you, and uh, no, you won't. I'm going back. So he got up, got his clothes, walked out, went four blocks down the street to the door of Juvenile Hall, knocked on the door and said, let me in. These people are crazy out here. <laughs> and uh, he never, and I, I went down and said, hey, how's your throat? My throat's fine. Okay. What I learned was, you don't have to do a prolonged, ongoing process some, with some people. He just boom, 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 gone. Which I thought was rather astounding. Yeah, it works well with phobias. This mm -hmm. method works well with a lot of things, but phobias is usually one second. Yeah. 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 The only thing we cannot cure is phobia for best life therapists. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's a bit more complicated. We need two sessions for that. It was very effective. Whoever goes uh, experiences in this life um, a trauma uh, that cannot be resolved, anything that triggers the event creates on the physical body the uh, sensations as if it is happening now and it could be unrelated to the event for me even uh, to listen to the news in the television and the, because it was war related so everything that uh, relates to the event had the same effect to me as, as the first time I experienced it. 
So although my brain had processed it that it was over, it's we are well, we are here, everything is okay. Um, the emotional level was not um, where my brain was. Okay. So after the recreation that we did, that part was gone. person who's like this, and then you, you watch the flower unfold. Petal by petal, they open up and become who they are. The turnarounds can be so fast and astonishing. I, I had a woman uh, who was born with a magnificent voice, and she grew up in New York City. Uh, but she was terrified of performing in front of groups of people. Uh, she would sing for her family and small circles of friends. And it so happens that her family was quite musical, and uh, one day, this was some years ago, they invited Leonard Bernstein to come and hear her. Bernstein was at the party and he heard it. He said, this woman has an astonishing voice. Why isn't she singing in the Metropolitan Opera? And the family said, well, she's crippled by this terror of performing in public. She, this is the biggest group, you know, 20 people were there, that she's comfortable uh, singing in front of. And he said, this is ridiculous. She's got to get out there. Well, her family pushed her and they heard of me. They sent her to me. In one session, we got a story where she was a woman who, in a Puritan community in early New England, had been caught in adultery and had been horribly public, uh, publicly punished. Uh, she was first of all beaten and whipped and then it seemed privately the fathers came in and raped her and then she was thrown out of the community. She carried with her from this past life the imprint of public humiliation. It was obvious in one session why of course she couldn't speak in public. So we took her through, we did the various things we do in our work to re-empower her and get those nasty Puritans out of her mind. Within six months, she was auditioning at the Vienna Opera, and within two years she was singing at the Metropolitan. One session turned her around. That's how fast our work can be. It's efficient, it's focused, it's effective, it goes to the cause, to the, uh, to the, uh, and to the process which will change that, the cause. And it, no matter where that cause is, if it's in Rome 5,000 years ago, or if it's five minutes ago as you got out of your car, this process will address that and, help, and resolve it. That's what makes regression therapy special. I think especially the way that it cures so fast. I have clients who have been walking around with migraine over 20 years. 25 years depression, a young, young man. And he, this man is not even 40. So as a teenager, his depression started. And um, he was uh, in homes, he was in psychiatric help, he, he used medicines, and he was uh, getting himself out of that. And he found me, himself. He did about eight or ten sessions, which is quite a lot. Mostly people heal before that. But um, there was a lot he had to deal with. And then he phoned me. He stopped therapy because he was going on a holiday with his new girlfriend. And he felt bright and, and very good. And he said, so now I want to use the money for holidays. And it, it's splendid. This is, his life is starting. So that is my answer to what makes regression therapy special. What I like most, I must say that's the results. 
when you got a person over the point where he didn't co where he couldn't pass himself the rest he can do himself and the client walks his own life but just for this bump in his life we search and get him over the threshold or through the mud or whatever it is and he can continue you know once I had a once I had a, a Japanese student and we were doing a past life regression and he was in a big training program of mine and this was a private session and um, he went through the body death and I said okay what happens next and then all of a sudden his whole body lifts up and his face I'm going to cry, his face makes me cry his face opened up and I, I never said a word because my translator sitting there and we looked at each other and that young man in that moment he expanded his energy and the whole room was filled with light and it was like it mirrored my own and my translator to it mirrored who we really are and in that moment that young man reached enlightenment so not that people leave the feeling hallelujah but that there's a life change hmm. notice what it does to you Body, body, mind, mind, how are you feeling with this? Uh, you. What did complete. you say? You. New and complete? Yeah, it's, it starts to. Yeah, so I, I have to say it in German. Yeah, it's fake, that's clicker. It starts to well in well, me to read. It. It's not made it softer, it's softer. Swinging and shrink would click. Swinging and clicking. Wiggling bells, twinkling bells. Something like that? Yeah, it's like very tiny bells, very high sound and yeah, it's and it's also like so hard to describe as an image but it's this sounds and music and stars and universe and dark yeah. and colorful spots and it's this energy it's oneness in you yes and water too <laughs> and water great yeah. So enjoy this, Masha. And while you are enjoying everything you have just described in two languages, feel it. But he went to the class, of course, the next weekend. He's, he's a student doing a regression in practice, and he's crying. And so he came out of the session, and I said, what's it like to have reached that moment of enlightenment, and now you're in your body feeling feelings and crying? He said, I'm still in a body. He said, I still have my feelings, but he said, I will never look at life the same again. It helped me enormously to make an emotional cleansing. It's, it's, it was done very thoroughly and very needed, and I came back uh, another woman. I felt different, I was different. So, lead me back to the origins of my pain and let me see the source of my fears, my conflicts and body pains. Bring in together all the disconnected parts of me. And how will you do that, dear therapist? I have huge confidence in the process. Even if the answer doesn't come, the client is thinking, what shall I say? 
the soul does the job already. The body is resonating. It's already going, and I can see that now. Okay. So you are there, and you are traveling for healing. You feel sad now. So from that moment, go on to the next moment. What is happening there? Um, I um, I was um, riding in the mountains. Mm -hmm. Riding with a donkey. With a donkey. I got somewhere, it doesn't matter, and there um, are other people like me. And we we meet from time to time. And then? Feel your hand. Your hand is indicating something. You're moving your hand. What is happening? Continue. I don't know, some... Somebody did something to my stomach, but I don't know if it's them or someone else, I don't know. Yeah, and uh, what do you mean, somebody did something to my stomach from the outside? Or from the inside? Uh, yeah, at first I thought um, it's something like wood, but they... I don't know, they had um, a weapon like a sword or something. Yeah. And my uh, belly was bleeding. Yeah. So I have a huge process, trust, and that is what my client feels. So they lay down and one man said, I already feel healed. <laughs> but it's because of that facilitating trance. There was a trance that was built before we started the session. Uh, I had met with the therapist and we had discussed um, not the details of the situation because he didn't want to go into that in the present life, uh, but there was trust um, in place before we started and it continued through the process. One of my favorite questions is, okay, what do we need to do now to resolve this so that it's free and clear? And they'll tell you. <laughs> the golden rule is you can never take anybody into a space you haven't been to yourself if you're, if you're a therapist. I assign healing to the client. I'm not here as God who's going to wave my magic wand, you're going to feel better. I have tools and methods and also energy to hold your space. And you come and you do whatever it is you need to do in this space. It's a scientific attitude of, I'm always in a session thinking about hypothesis. It could be this, it could be that. How can I test that out? So I will ask some questions to find out if my hypothesis is right. And I have always more than one hypothesis. So I don't think, oh, they have this uh, migraine, so probably it will be that. It could be that, or that, or that. So how are you going to differentiate? Or it could be something else. This, this, this testing of hypothesis is a kind of part of your mindset. That is very important in the way I work. And I call it, in my training programs, the detective part of our work. I never felt that he was imposing any feelings or situations on me. I always felt that um, I went there my, by myself and uh, whatever I was experiencing, it was me. Uh, his influence was, uh, in a way, he worked as a guidance, asking me questions to clarify since they were not clear. All the resources needed for fundamental healing are inside the client. Mm -hmm. And I heartily dislike any therapy, also any regressive therapist, who is taking resources from the outside, 
like readings or laying hands or or diagnosis with long surveys and all that it's all there we have to help the client together maybe we have to help him to take seriously what's inside him and the simplest way to do that is to listen what they are telling mm -hmm. people are not limited to this planet this solar system this universe and so that's where again the soul comes in that it's far beyond matter and time um, and so don't limit the possibilities stay with your client and do what they need to do We did a group regression experience and everyone was directed to go back to an image of the past life. And a man came up and he said, I'm a rock. So I tried to talk to this rock. I couldn't get very much movement out of a rock, as you can imagine. So I said, okay, move forward a few thousand years. Nothing's changed. <laughs> well, later I realized, this was in the early days of my work, later I realized he was hiding he didn't want to go into a real story and again a part of him had left the body and gone and hidden in this rock there was a real story somewhere else but in those days I didn't know how to get to it so I'm always suspicious of people who either go to the angels or become rocks or trees they're usually running away from something and particularly and uh, some people would disagree with this um, particularly people who go into memories of extraterrestrials and spaceships if they've already done a lot of work on themselves in this life and other past lives which are concrete I will accept it but if in the first few, few sessions they want to go to Mars or they want to go to Alpha Centauri or some other planetary system I'm very skeptical I treat it as a possible escape and say, I want you to come down into your body and see what's happening here. And usually there's some trauma in the body that they're escaping from. So um, those kind of cases can be challenging. because we are, there are many levels that we exist on and many things we need to do. So I combined the body, the mind, the soul. I combined uh, the physical movements, the gestalt of it. I, I combined the voice dialogues. The uh, therapist is a tool in regression therapy. We don't use medication, we don't use some outside tool, we use our own being in asking questions, in trying to be clever and ask the right question for the client. So you have to be a presence that doesn't disturb the client. And when my presence has a lot of issues of my own, the client will feel that. We have a saying, at least some of us, which seems very simple and is very simple. It's follow the energy. If you focus on something in a session, something will happen and the next step will be there. Mm -hmm. okay. And the, that may be good feelings, that may be bad feelings, that may be strange thought, it doesn't matter. The next thing that comes up is carrying the energy. So it's a very strange flow sometimes, but afterwards you, you see the logic and the beauty. When I first started doing this work, I did great sessions from the beginning and people would cry and they'd feel emotions and somatics would turn on and turn off and, and healings would occur. And after two years, it occurred to me that my clients never got angry. And I thought, okay, when things like that are happening, I have to look here. What's going on that none of my clients ever get angry? Obviously, I had fear of anger, my own personal issue, and so I needed to go... Um, get myself into some therapy and say, okay, hey, i got to work with this. And interestingly, after I did my own work on anger, 
I started getting all these angry clients. And I remember one client came in and he said, I feel so much rage. And I said, okay, feel your feelings. <laughs> and, and, and I put a cushion there and I said, okay, now feel. And, and he says, Trisha, if I ever let all this rage out, I will destroy your office. I said, go ahead. Of course, he never did because I put in boundaries. But the point is, I could hold the space for him to hold his anger. I think the most difficult one that comes to mind was uh, a woman who came to a workshop and she's a, she'd observed our work in some video and she said, um, I believe you work in pairs in your workshops and someone asks questions and someone does a journey. And I said, yes, that's correct. And she said, I don't think I could do that work. And I said, why not? She said, I hate it. I went to a workshop once like that a Groff holotropic workshop and people are sitting by you asking questions. She said, I don't want anyone to ask me questions. So I thought, how are we going to do this process if I can't ask questions to this woman? So finally I got the solution. I said, I'd like you to do a little experiment. I'd like you to close your eyes and I'm going to do something. So she said, all right. So she closed her eyes and I came up close to her and I said, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. What's your first reaction? She said, I won't tell you. I won't tell you anything. And then I realized what it was. She was stuck in a memory of an interrogation. And she'd been a stubborn prisoner and refused to speak. So interrogation, being asked questions, was the story itself. And it had got involved with the regression technique. So I simply used that as the way in and where she went by repeating the phrase, I won't tell you, I won't tell you anything. You can ask me all the questions you want, I won't tell you a thing. She went to Russia back in the Stalinist era and she was a scientist who had been part of um, a, new, a new movement that was considered heretical by, I think it was the Lysenko period. And uh, this scientist was refusing to speak and he was tortured and finally killed, but he never spoke out. So that was the story, but it was a very tough one to crack. And when we finish working with someone, they could, we, none of us can ever say, we did it. That's one thing we're all very clear on. We don't do it. The people we work with do it. One day I was looking at a magazine, and it it was a picture of a, of a glove, a dirty, cement-filled, fingers torn out glove, uh, torn at the edges, and in the center there was an egg yolk. And with no thought, I cut it out, framed it, and hung it on the wall in my office. It hung there for a couple of months, and finally, one day a client came in and says, Trisha, you have all these beautiful things. What is that ugly thing doing on your wall? And again, with no thought, the words popped out of my mouth, that's my clients. I'm going, <laughs> you know what do I say? And, and, and the reality is that they come in and present you with a glove. And it's torn, it's broken, <laughs> and it's cracked in the fingers. But, but the perfection is always there. And you can access that when you're working with the person. And even if you can't, the person can't access it consciously, I know it's there. And so I am always in touch with working with that. So I see separation. On my search for healing, I found that there are many mainstream psychotherapeutic methods but also a variety of alternative methods, promising changes for the better. What is the difference between these mainstream methods and regression therapy? 
for me it was quite liberating to get out of what I now see as the rather narrow world of childhood trauma that if you're raised as a traditional psychologist and particularly as I was in the psychoanalytic school you're taught by Freud and the post Freudians to look for every problem in childhood so I, I was doing regression long before I'd have heard of past lives but regression to childhood and in fact past life regression borrows the word regression from the Freudians. The Freudians were the first to use it. They talk of a regressed state, a regressing back to infancy. And in a typical psychoanalysis, you learn in a sort of this waking dream state to free associate back to childhood and memories will come spontaneously. Freudians don't guide you, they just let it happen. It was my personal need in a case that could not be treated otherwise with the uh, conventional uh, techniques in psychology, for example, cognitive recognition therapy or methods of similar or psychotherapy. What's also rewarding, although it's rewarding with a kind of almost bitterness in it, is of course we often come across people that have been very long in the mills of psychiatry or psychology and it's so terribly ineffective, it's so terribly inefficient that to put that all aside and go straight to the problem and really resolve it even when people have almost given up the possibility that this could be resolved. That really um, motivates me. Well, it was interesting that um, Brian Weiss, the psychiatrist mm. who tells his story of how he got into past lives, if you really address the question of free association back to the origin seriously, the unconscious mind doesn't hear just childhood. Brian Weiss famously said to a woman, I want you to go back to the origin of your problem. And he forgot to say, in childhood. He assumed that everyone knew that all their problems started in childhood. Well, the unconscious heard, let's go back to the origin in another lifetime. And that's where this woman went. Yes. When you go to another lifetime, it is much more freeing because issues that you've had which really you've tried to squeeze into the box of a childhood trauma and they don't fit when for example you've grown up depressed and disliking crowds and hating uh, certain kinds of weather and you trace it back to a childhood event where say grandmother died and you went to the funeral it was raining well to a degree this will explain your childhood depression but if you really go deeper, you might find, and there's a famous case of this in television that Carol Bowman researched, you might find that this child was remembering a much greater tragedy, uh, the Battle of the Somme, where thousands and thousands of soldiers died in rain and mud. And this child, that in, in the research she did, always get, got depressed when, when it was raining and didn't want to go out and play. And then one day he saw a documentary about the war and he said, I was there. And then the memory started to come back. So if you put depre allow depression to go back to the much greater memory, you'll find that we were involved in, in horrible mass um, trauma situations. Thousands of people die of a plague. Thousands of people die in a war. Thousands of people are uprooted from their country and the pain and the, and, the, and the suffering from these events is enormous and it explains how some people really look, some children look as though they're born depressed they came in upset, they came in little wise old souls and it's nothing to do with potty training and whether they were breastfed, but the Freudians are always looking for these explanations in the parents so we get a much bigger picture of the origins of human suffering simple example of a young girl hearing voices. They disturb her when she makes examinations at school. And um, there's a waiting list with the child psychiatrist who is going to treat her. And her mother is so 
fearful of this whole event, that her child hears voices, that she tells a friend, and that friend, her son heard voices one year ago. So this girl came to me only once, because I was the only one who asked, what do the voices say? So you take it seriously and you deal with it, and it was only one session, and it was gone. So that is evidence-based to me. God job. Uh, priests, doctors, and psychotherapists. And the God job is about my ego and I know it all and I'm going to tell you what you need to get better. You're going to think like this and act like this and behave like this and take this drug. And I would say that what we're doing is the opposite. We are, like you said, Roger, instead of diagnosing, uh, um, analyzing, and giving dope, we're sitting back and we're saying, okay, what's happening? And that's not the God job. There's nothing miraculous on the planet. There's no such thing as a miracle. That's, people use that when they're trying to sell you something. Um, it do, this therapy does work. I have seen it work. And I am perfectly willing to prove that by working with you. I have never said or taught anything to anybody that I haven't used and found to be absolutely true in my private practice. I don't hype, I don't hype it. I don't just, you know, go screaming through the streets yelling, hooray, I can save the world. I simply say, this is what I do. This is what I know it will do. I'll be glad to prove that to you if you like. But if you don't want to listen to the evidence, you can discard anything. We know of cases that people have had terminal diseases, and after some work in regression therapy, they were cured. And the doctor said, apparently we have misdiagnosed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you can <coughs> <see> <coughs> <anyone>. <coughs> so I think we just go on with our work and let it be. shocking to uh, traditional psychotherapists the idea that you can get results in two or three sessions because we've been conditioned from years of half a century or more of psychoanalysis to think that therapy takes a long, long time and you're sort of chiseling away at this problem and slowly you will get there, where this work goes right to the core very, very quickly. Mm. And uh, of course they're going to resist. And psychoanalysis itself was resisted for a long time and one of the ways you dismiss something you say it's not scientific at the same time those people who dismiss science refuse to look at the evidence exactly. there's a lot of narrow-mindedness in the scientific establishment there's a lovely story about Sir Isaac Newton in the 18th century who of course is considered the great uh, physicist who brought in a whole new way of looking at the physical world. Uh, but it's not generally known that he was also an astrologer and an alchemist. Mm -hmm. This was a private part and he didn't talk so much about that publicly because it's always been an underground subject. And apparently at a meeting of the Royal Society, uh, some young intellectual came up to him uh, who would heard about his secret studies. And what he said to me epitomizes presumption. And apparently he came up saying, ah, oh, Professor Newton, I gather you are studying these matters of astrology and alchemy and these things. How can a man like you, of such intellect and intelligence, waste their time on such nonsense? And Newton kept his cool and said to him quite simply, my dear sir, I have studied the matters and you clearly have not.
And how about this lively bunch of people undertaking these journeys with so many? How do they all connect? What might we think of this association of international regression therapists called Earth? I learned. A substantial number of regression therapists in Europe and also from all around the world have joined together to form the Earth Association. Above all else, this association aims to develop professional standards for the practice of regression therapy. Part of these standards is that all members commit to a code of conduct. To foster communication between therapists, Earth offers an internet platform with information for both therapists and those seeking help for their problems in life. Through the internet, therapists can also exchange experiences and discuss professional issues with each other, thus overcoming any geographical distances. Research is also an important part of the task taken on by Earth, and so that is also nurtured. So, we started Earth, I think, in 2003 on the First World Congress. First meeting was in 2006 in Frankfurt. Then, um, already we are now international outside Europe, because the students that some teachers have in Brazil, like Roger Wulger and uh, Hans ten Dam in uh, uh, India and uh, Trisha in Japan and many more in many other places, um, they like to join in because it is a forum where you can get more information and where you can also show what you're doing and ask your fellow colleagues, tell me what you think about it. <laughs> Earth? Earth. It's, it's the only one I know about. All the rest of them have all folded and gone away. Or they're in the process of folding and going away. And I think these people are very brave to do this. I wouldn't take this on for a bet. I love it. Because, because you have so many people from so many different countries. And that's exciting because this afternoon at lunch we were talking about Out of the Turk and Rumi's poems and, and, and the origin of, of all of this in, in Turkey and the Middle East and, 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 and the two Turkish people who are here. And so you have different concepts, different ways of being. Here you have people from all over uh, different countries on the board. So I think it provides a, a, a much more expanded concept of, of how to interact around the world with these methods. We started it to combine those people who might feel alone in their countries because there aren't so many yet, like um, uh, our colleague in Russia who is in an area where he's the only one. Um, so we, we started to combine uh, people and to, to, to um, enable exchange and interaction. Um, you need the, the intersubject co intersubjective community of the field. Um, I can do something and somebody else can judge it and can ask me why did you do this, why did you do that. We are 
comparing our structures, our methods. And um, it is, Earth is an effort to invite everybody practicing regression therapy. And in the same time, we learn from each other and support each other to bring better trainings and to feel more certain about what you are bringing because your colleagues have already told you what they do or don't like about it. I think the value of Earth is, is quite big and it can be even more extensive um, than I can judge now. I think it's doing incredible work and uh, I hope it will grow and grow and reach more people. I certainly support it in that. Um, at a certain moment people will look for a, a therapist and they want to have somebody who um, dares to be challenged by his colleagues. And so when you are a member of Earth, it at least shows that you are up to date and not afraid to share your issues with your colleagues. Um, it must be a quality mark also, not only a ground for us to find each other, but a quality instrument. Well, Earth is, um, is the beginning of a lot more. I wonder whether this regression approach has any future. What do the experts think? There are so many people out there who would use this method if they knew about it. Oh, in fact, I have three wishes still. It's research, research, and research. And of course, good research and publishing the results. Um, yeah, that's really what we need. As few publicity as possible. So that we can do our work calmly and it will expand anyway simply because of the results. Uh, I wish the academic psychologists would, uh, I mustn't say something rude, um, would uh, wake up a bit and see that there's a much bigger world that we have to offer, a much bigger picture of therapy. Um, I think we not just the academic psychologists, the media have very narrow minds in the Anglo-Saxon world and uh, we need some really good PR to get into the media, to get into the academies and show that this is one of the most effective therapies that, that there are on the planet and that we need to let go of these narrow ideas of what the soul is and what consciousness is much bigger picture we have to share. Slow growth in a solid manner. Don't grow too fast, but grow and spread as we are doing now, solid quality. And I hope that many people in need will know how to find us, how to find a regression therapist. That is my wish because it's so needed. This is such a beautiful field. It's so needed. Yeah. I think that's my wish. So there may be so much change that one day our therapy, as we know it, will also come to its end. And this reminds me of that old joke that somebody is saying, about sex, if they ever invent something better, I keep doing it at the site. <laughs> <laughs> if they ever invent a better process, I will continue doing this at the site.
doubts have been eased, many of my questions answered, and so I will start this journey inside. But I take my courage, my responsibility, and my will to solve my problems, to soothe my pains and free myself from obstacles and constraints and step forward into the future, healing the past. It will be for the better. Let's move into the future. Thank you. 